We who believe in freedom cannot rest. All right, sing it if you know it. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ella Baker, Bernice Johnson, Regan. Pleased to be with you again this morning. My name is Arlita Little. I'm an arts program officer with the McKnight Foundation, where we believe that Minnesota thrives when its artists thrive. <laughs> artists are at the heart, at the center of our theory of change. Artists, yesterday, today, tomorrow. Yesterday with Langston Hughes's poem, we had the opportunity to sample the voice of a rich and mighty past. Today, let's begin again with a poet and a poem, asking ourselves what our present circumstances tell us about what tomorrow may bring. Who is going to inhabit the future that we are trying to build? What do they have to say? Dante Collins is the 2016 recipient of the Academy of American Poets Most Promising Young Poet Award. An artist weaned, raised, and currently living in St. Paul. At the age of 20, Dante has already been writing poetry for more than a decade. Dante Collins is an alum of True Art Speaks, the organization founded by our very own Tish Jones. Yes. A two-time participant in the International Youth Poetry Festival, Brave New Voices, and featured widely in Afropunk, the Star Tribune, Feminist Culture, Minnesota Public Radio, and the Artidote. Dante Collins has performed at colleges and universities around the country, and Dante's first chapbook, Autopsy, will be published in 2017. If the future could talk, what might it tell us about our present? Let's listen. Lately, when asked, how are you? I respond with a name no longer living, Rakia, Jamar, Sandra. I am alive by luck at this point. I wonder often if the gun that will unmake me is yet made. What white birth will bury me? How many bullets like a flock of blue jays will come carry my black to its final bed? Which photo will be used to water down my blood? Today I did not die and there is no God or law to thank. The bullet missed my head and landed in another. Today, I passed a mirror and did not see a body. Instead, a suggestion, a debate, a blank post-it note there looking back. I haven't enough room to both rage and weep. I go to cry and each tear turns to steam. I say, I matter. I matter. And a ghost white hand appears over my mouth. Mm -hmm. 
times they are a changing. Past, present, future. Time might be a flowing river. You know, scientists regularly get together to debate fundamental questions about the nature of the universe. It's part of their practice to challenge their assumptions about the world as they know it. It happened earlier this year in June when about 60 physicists along with a handful of philosophers and researchers from other branches of science gathered at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Canada. At this time in Cosmology Conference, they wrestled together with questions about the nature of time, whether or not there is evidence to support a physical distinction between the past, the present, and the future, whether time can only move in one direction, whether time is fundamental or emergent. At this moment, here with you, I'm proud to be part of a community of practice that is wrestling together, engaged in a critical examination of the assumptions that define our known universe. A community that is willing to challenge existing philosophical and physical barriers to effectiveness. A community that is open to testing new possibilities and adaptations. If we think about it, isn't this exactly what artists do? This morning, I have the honor of introducing three dynamic artists who are testing and redefining our known universe. Oscar Lee, Amanda Lovely, and Rihanna Yazi. These artists are building bridges through time, collapsing geographic space, improvising new forms, within physical and social bureaucratic structures, invoking imagination, craft, and love to render the unseen visible. Just like James Baldwin wrote, the role of the artist is exactly the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. Oscar Lee comes to us as an artistic ambassador of the Hmong diaspora, a child of refugees, her people relocated here following America's secret war in Laos. Queer and multidisciplinary, Oscar embodies the interstitial spaces in her identity and in her artistry that regularly render our existing language, definitions, categories inaccurate, insufficient, and frankly, irrelevant. Forging new futures that root in the past, Oscar Lee is a recognized cultural producer and placemaker. Don't let her shy smile fool you. She is a fearless fashionista, reinterpreting and expanding Hmong tradition to craft contemporary visual forms in wearable art. She is an innovative entrepreneur. And among her most recent social enterprises involves collaboration with artists and makers from among the Mekong River in Southeast Asia. Amanda Lovely blends the visual training she received at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design with her passion for science to probe possibilities for human connection and to activate the public in the practice of public art. As a city artist in residence, she's embedded in St. Paul's city government with a charge to apply the creative process to solving community problems. Her work inserts opportunities for vulnerability into bureaucratic structures. Let's stay with that juxtaposition for just a moment. Vulnerability, bureaucracy, vulnerability, bureaucracy. See, we forget that governments and institutions are just ways that we as human beings choose to organize ourselves. 
as our creations, they take on our characteristics. And if we forget our humanity, our governments and institutions will be inhumane. In this urban village, Amanda Lovely's creative approaches to civic engagement are making the work of government more accessible, more representative, more honest and accountable, and more effective and humane. In a celebration of diverse forms and human expression that traverse time, Rihanna Yazi has embarked on the bold enterprise of creating a new cultural institution. Theater for, by, and about Native people. New Native theater. As a Navajo playwright, producer, director, filmmaker, and actor, living here in Minneapolis, Rihanna Yazi is holding space and making visible a vibrant Native performing arts community. Make no mistake, New Native theater is about the reclamation of physical and psychological space for indigenous artists and audiences. With this organization, Rihanna Yazi is sparking the combustible power of theatrical storytelling to explore and expand perspectives within Native experiences, invoking agency and ownership in cultural production, and working with the page and the stage to transmute traumatic trajectories into creative triumphs. We'll hear from her. We'll hear from them. I yield the stage to the tremendous talents of these three transformational artists. Morning, everyone. Morning. <laughs> Toke mo anga mu, vau ki la de, ji ten ji cha, yang ying la sha, mu la la cha ka la. When we don't have songs, we have to create our own. As a daughter of Hmong Lao refugees, it's taken my entire life to put together who I am. To this day, my parents don't talk about their lives before resettling us in France. They were orphans of the American War 41 years ago. They sacrificed everything they could on the pursuit to reunite with relatives, hold on to our roots, and for better opportunities for us, leading us here to the United States. At that time, I knew I was Hmong, but not much else. I couldn't even speak Hmong or English. Hmong people have had to continuously survive genocide and erasure. There is no Hmong word for art, nor to describe myself or my circumstances. Queer, undocumented, stateless. As one of my friends has said, Hmong people don't have a long history that's been documented, and so everything you do is the first of its kind, and so are the examples I share with you today. It's been imperative for me to create my own platform in order to be able to showcase my own work. Institutionally, systematically, and across sectors, I am told I must do one or the other, but not both. And when in reality is that the system is limiting. I could not exist if I waited for the system to make room for me. So my work is about preserving, yet reinterpreting Hmong arts and culture while navigating the lines of assimilation and reappropriation. It's through fashion, words, and songs. So one of the ways that I continue to reimagine Hmong culture is through Hmong textile. And since Hmong people are hill tribe people, we do not have a country, and therefore we don't have a flag. So this inspired me to create a Hmong flag that embraces pride using the traditional Hmong textiles for shades of yellow, soy, the first Hmong LGBTQ organization in the world. And it was showcased during our local pride parade. As I mentioned earlier, there is no word for queer, gay, lesbian, trans in the Hmong language. And therefore, when it comes to the fight for same-sex marriage, despite the legislation, our community was still left out. So the possibility for a cultural marriage is still denied to many of us, 
which creates a real disconnect on this issue. And so to, at that time, to engage community, I curated a marriage-themed fashion show at the Soy New Year, which is like the queer lunar Hmong New Year. And community members model traditional and contemporary expressions of cultural marriage clothing. So this helped open up the conversation for people to see themselves on the possibility of marriage in whole terms where traditional organizing and canvassing couldn't reach. This further inspired me to create a collection called Little Black Shh. And this was an exploration of gender expression, um, taboos, and the special occasion Hmong wear garments that we typically wear at the Hmong New Year celebration and marriages and such. The collection was shown at Fresh Traditions Fashion Show, the first ever um, Hmong American um, annual fashion show uh, by Center for Hmong Arts and Talent here in St. Paul. And so this brought in expressions of gender and um, of among Hmong people on the larger community platform. On the left of this photo, you'll see my partner and I dressed in traditional Hmong green clothing uh, that my mother made. Hmong clothing are made to be wrapped around one size fits all. And on the right, you'll see my reinterpretation of the Hmong green dress in a high-low skirt and corset, reflecting the contemporary expressions of femininity with a blow-tie flare, which is typically um, a men's piece. On this next slide here, you'll see the Hmong uh, traditional vest, typically worn by men. And on the right, I have a model that would not be comfortable typically wearing a, a skirt or a dress. And so this led me to creating this vest so that she too could wear Hmong clothes that fit and doesn't limit her to traditional women's clothing. Now Fresh Traditions is turning 10 this year, and I'll be showing my latest collection there where Hmong clothes meet streetwear. Designing culture forward clothing is a creative thrill for me, but it's not just about vanity. It's been an act of resistance against outsiders who time and again appropriate and erase our narratives. Traditional monk clothes require intricate skills that are disappearing and is time intensive. It's difficult to continue passing down the traditions of making when Hmong people are spread across the world. And technology has changed how we make them. While it has opened up access to dialogues around cultural exchange and appreciation, it has also increased appropriation. And it's becoming more and more important to address the capitalist system that we operate in. Companies continue to borrow from cultures, not accurately crediting or engaging these communities. At worst, the artist's work are taken, photographed, duplicated for fast profit. And of course, they're not compensated. So this happened to the community of my people just a few years ago, or Hmong people. We're a large multi-billion dollar corporation, digitally printed Hmong scarves, and labeled them as Aztec. In response, Red Green Rivers, a social enterprise uh, created by three pioneer Hmong women was born, and they work with women artisans from Southeast Asia. Um, this winter, Red Green River and my clothing label, Oz Couture, will be presenting a collection that is sourced from Southeast Asia and designed by US designers. Through this, we are reappropriating and beginning cultural exchange from the Hmong diaspora experience. And this is about owning the direction in which we invite audiences to partake in the global Hmong community and new narratives by Hmong artists. So very importantly, it is about leveraging our culture for economic empowerment. In the future, it's our hope that Asian artists from Southeast Asia and both the US get to meet each other, learn and create from each other, and weaving across our global economy, community, and traditions. Now, when we transform what we know to create new narratives, that's when we can actually begin to see ourselves, our possibilities, and our futures. Our cultural survival depends on our will to exist and create these meanings, and it allows us to become our authentic selves despite our historical trauma, and to finally learn our own stories. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> good morning. Artists are leaders. I am a leader. With the many problems facing us in the 21st century, we're not going to solve things in one sector. We need cross-sector collaborations. I'm going to show you four different projects that I've worked on that deal with this. 
The Call and Answer project is about strangers holding hands. It's about square dancing. It's about connecting. In both undergrad and graduate school, I studied photography and media. And at the end of graduate school was when I realized these were only tools that I had learned to change how people think. What was originally going to be a short documentary film became so much more. In the first summer of Northern Spark, an all-night arts festival here in the Twin Cities, I transformed the Minnesota Center of Book Arts into a pie shop where if you held hands with a stranger, you received a pie, an all-night square dance. And in the basement, we printed 2,000 books on four letter presses throughout the whole evening. And the books were the stories and lessons I had learned through the art of square dancing. Also, I have no rhythm. <laughs> The year-long project ended at the Walker Art Center's open field with a short documentary film, a square dance, and if you held hands with a stranger there, you received one of the books. This was the project that got me started in realizing that the gallery system was not the only place where artists could work, that I could work with and for a community. It was the same year that Public Art St. Paul posted the position of city artist. I saw it and I knew it was my dream job and it still is my dream job. To best explain my job, I'm going to refer to Public Art St. Paul, the small arts nonprofit, as a beehive, and me, the artist, as a bee, flying between the city. And so each one of these trees here represents one of the city departments, siloed and separated, whether it be parks, planning and economic development, public works, libraries, the police. And the tulips on the bottom are the residents of the city of St. Paul. And so as the artist, I fly between both, listening, learning, translating. And in the process, pollinating and spreading knowledge. And also making blue ribbon honey, also known as projects. <laughs> so the first project I'm going to talk to you about that I did as the city artist is Urban Flower Field. It's a cross-pollination between art, the civic process, a community, and environmental science. Here's what it looked like when I first saw the space. It was a fenced off gravel pit, a piece of land that had been donated to the city of St. Paul to become a park. But it sat fenced off for five years and used as a parking lot to build a new development. The residents were mad. This is what it became. A live science project with 96 plots of biodiverse flowers performing soil remediation. We were testing does one flower clean the soil better than multiple together. It was, the design was based on the Fibonacci sequence, which in my mind was the moment where science could be designed, defined as beautiful and thus as art. It was a collaboration with the University of St. Thomas's Department of Environmental Science. Here the students are laying out the plots. Throughout the years, we've held many events there. Every summer, we start our season by inviting the residents to come add their mark to the park and paint the field stones that surround the plots. We've held movie nights there, music festivals. This summer was our third summer, making science visible and making downtown a little bit more magical. The second project I'm going to talk to you about that I've done as a city artist is pop-up meeting. It came out of attending a lot of community meetings and realizing no one else was there. <laughs> and starting to question why. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and thinking of all the barriers that were stopping people from attending, whether it be the fact that our meetings were held at 7 p.m. and assuming you had a 9 to 5 job, that there was no childcare, that everything was in English and maybe that wasn't your language, that even if you showed up that you felt empowered to speak, and I knew that I had to change the system. So I made a popsicle truck. <laughs> In our first summer, we hosted 17 meetings. We collected 1,153 surveys. 70% of the people we reached said they had never been to a community meeting before. I know everyone likes graphs, so I threw one in. <laughs> the blue represents the typical meeting and the red, a pop-up meeting. So showing that at typical meetings, people who showed up always showed up for meetings. So the same people were coming. 
We handed out 1,828 popsicles, and I wish I could have brought them for you here today. They're locally made organic popsicles by an all-woman-run organization. I'm not spreading childhood obesity. And <laughs> the flavor is sweet St. Sweet Paul. This was our second summer. We hosted 34 meetings. We handed out 3,160 popsicles, more than doubling from our first summer. We got four iPads to help us with translation. We worked with seven different departments within the city, and we're getting ready for next year. This is one of the few projects that is funded across departments in the city of St. Paul. I'm going to end with a project that I've done as me, as an independent artist. This is the Friendship Forest. The Friendship Forest is about caring for our city, caring for each other, and breaking down barriers by uniting residents in the act of planting their future forest. The Chinese proverb says, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. In one day, 100 strangers planted 200 trees in a park in downtown St. Paul. Each tree was planted by two people who did not know each other. Each tree was named. Each tree was adopted. Each tree was given a blanket that said a friendship, a future, a forest. Then through an interactive map, we plotted the trees, and the trees started to reach out to those who had planted them. Each friendship forester receives updates from their tree about its health, its size, reminders to visit. Like a friendly update stating, the sun is shining, great weather for a picnic, come visit your tree friend, George. <laughs> this project is a great collaboration between City Arborists, the University of Minnesota researchers, and myself. Again, whether we're thinking about human connection, cleaning our urban soils, reaching and inviting all residents into the civic process, or increasing our own urban canopy cover, who better to tackle these issues than an artist? Artists are leaders. Thank you for supporting us. And now I'd like to ask you all to stand. and put your hands on your hips and be the superheroes that you all are. That was pretty cool. <laughs> All right, don't start the timer yet, okay. <laughs> uh, I have so many things to tell you. Um, so um, I wanted to talk, uh, I usually don't talk about myself and the work that I do, um, but it really is, it underlines all the work and the reasoning um, that goes into uh, why I created New Native Theater, which is a Native American theater company here in the Twin Cities that focuses on making theater relevant for Native community members um, and also to create a pathway uh, into the performing arts as a meaningful career. Um, so it's important in order to do that is to start with unexpected intersections when you are telling Native stories. And, and that's where I start when I tell Native stories. Um, when we make stories with ourselves at the center as Native people, um, that's unexpected and it's revolutionary because we're, we're asked so often to tell our stories in contrast to the dominant narrative and usually, um, it's with someone from that dominant culture as a main character who gets to learn from our history, our pain, um, and at the expense of our expense of our own fully realized lives and ambitions. Um, I think creating unexpected native stories are important because it actually humanizes indigenous peoples who have for so long been robbed of their full aliveness in what we now call this modern narrative. Um, it also expands the art form of theater itself. And if you can just think of how revolutionary incorporating hip hop was into the American theater, um, 
if we could see ways that Native artists are authentically inserting their gifts and their talents from our own cultures into the American theater that is ripe for setting a revolutionary change. Um, so the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just sort of go through some of the plays that I've written um, that start with these unconventional, unexpected narratives um, that put Native people and our concerns first without looking to the outside. Um, usually there are um, tropes that um, Native stories have been told in contrast to, which is, of course, sort of the, the, the John Dunbar uh, dances with wolves when, we, when there's a non-Native character that we get to uh, uh, enlighten. And then also um, more recent Native narratives um, that have become a new stereotype are inserting immigrant stories onto the Native experience. For example, I'm sure you've heard Native stories where the Native character themselves doesn't know their culture and has to go back home to meet wise elders to understand who they are. I really reject that narrative and so what I think is important um, is starting from a position of understanding that we are intact, we know who we are, and that we relate to the entire world from that uh, organizing pr principle. Um, so this play, um, on, at Zani Shush, The Woman Who Turned Into a Bear, um, it's based on a Navajo legend about a woman who turns into a bear. And uh, the play is a story of a young woman surrounded by elders who don't give her any good guidance. Um, and, and, um, and it also deals with um, sexuality, um, Christianity, corporate bureaucracy, um, and the continued relevance of uh, native cos um, cosmology in our lives. Um, and this, this was a play that sort of started off my um, work in sort of a professional arena. Um, because I, what I had hardly ever seen were Native women and Native stories told from our own perspective. And I'd never seen stories about Native sexuality that weren't about our oppression or suppression or depression. Um, the, next, the next unexpected... Uh, unexpected intersection that I found was this story that I found myself in. Um, this is a photograph by Lee Miller. Um, it uh, taken place in 1936 during the Surrealist summer camp. And I think that if anybody thinks about um, 1930s uh, Paris Surrealism, that you wouldn't necessarily see an indigenous narrative in there. Um, but I like to see how the way that um, Surrealist art was really beginning to look at non-realistic depictions of, um, of reality and sim symbolistic art. And so um, in this play, um, I worked with a visual artist, Carolyn Anderson, another nat of native Navajo artist, and we were looking at those intersections of um, uh, where symbolic um, Navajo art had already been doing this surrealist examination of our lives for, for time immemorial. Um, part of being able to insert yourself into a narrative that you wouldn't necessarily imagine that there are native people thinking about surrealist art in 1930s Paris allows you to decolonize um, and set up, um, s sets a ground for um, for repopulating the world with Native people who have been so meticulously removed from it. Um, and then this set me up to start with New Native Theater. So New Native Theater, creating unexpected um, narratives. Um, we created two plays that were very unexpected. Uh, the first one was um, uh, 2012 The Musical, um, where we took a look at the Mayan calendar from an uh, urban Minneapolis native perspective. Um, and in this play ended up being sort of this, um, I think it was the first full-length Native American rock musical. So that's unexpected to see native people in that. But it, but it was very, um, it was a way we made our own stories relevant to our community. And in that way, our community um, was invigorated and saw themselves in American theater and saw how they could participate. Another project we did was called Native Man the Musical, where, um, Again, putting some unexpected ideas together, putting Native men in a musical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, this uh, last play that I'm working on is a co-commission with the Public Theater and the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and it's an alternate take on the Pocahontas story. One of the really, boy, eight minutes goes by fast. One of the really important things I think about um, when creating unexpected narratives is, again, to humanize Native people. Because if you look at this period in time, it takes place, um, of course, during the Jamestown Pocahontas um, era, you never see these images as people. And so th that's one of the most important things to me. And so in doing this research, I found that Pocahontas had a, um, a sister who was lost to history named, um, named Cleopatra by the English. So anyways, this is a story that I'm working on now. Um, and then lastly, um, I see myself in this story. <laughs> Um, the story that I'm working on, um, Marichana, with the uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, um, has spurned a lot of uh, inf um, research and uh, has inspired me. And I found out that Nancy Reagan is actually a descendant of Pocahontas. So um, there's another unexpected place to, to find a native story. <laughs> and so. Um, and I'm just going to leave you with this photograph. Um, I, I love this because it's unexpected, it's humanizing. Um, and what do you see in this photograph? What are the connections there for you? For me, it's, it's an entire life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar, Amanda, Rihanna. Thank you so much for contributing your insights and your talents to us this morning. And uh, I hope that we will take up the challenge to open ourselves to the unexpected today. <laughs>